Um, so, yeah, the key is that um, in al the alternative to the directive and non-directive approaches is an active approach. It's an active stance. And the one of the helpful ways to think about this is that we are leading from the back, right? So we are asking the client, where should we begin? And then whatever initiative they take, we jump in and we join them. Um, this refers, like what aspect um, of the previous chapter does this touch on? This idea that some clients need one thing, some clients need another. Yeah. Clients respond specificity, exactly. And um, so we'll pick up with the tail end of um, chapter one. We'll breeze through it pretty quick. I know there will probably be a lot of questions on attachment theory uh, because people love asking questions about attachment theory and it's really interesting and important. Um, but today we are not going to be diving into attachment theory. Um, we're just going to be briefly covering it and there will be a whole chapter later on. So uh, for those big questions about attachment theory, that's when we will um, address those. Um, and so, but to review before jumping into the end of the, the lecture, our whole goal in this book, this text, is to learn how to utilize the relationship with the client as the tool for intervention. And so we're understanding what are the different aspects that go into relationship. We are becoming experts, but we are becoming experts in humanity, experts in relationship. One of the things that is going to get in your way as you're beginning are anxieties. Um, what is the source of most of these anxieties for the beginning therapist? Yeah. Performance anxieties. What's the source of, of these anxieties? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so what is, what is the solution? Yeah, that's the key, is, is to decentralize from yourself and really focus on the client, right? So our anxieties come, um, one of the biggest reasons is because we have unrealistic expectations. We don't allow ourselves to be beginners. Um, we are always going to be beginners at something that's difficult, but we just kind of have to accept that in the beginning of working as a therapist, there's a lot of times that you won't know what to do. The relief is that you don't know, you don't have to know what to do. One of the greatest challenges of working in the interpersonal process is that you have to let go of control of how the session is going to be and choose instead to be present and attend to the immediate needs of the client. And so um, we need to let go of our unrealistic expectations in the beginning and we need to lean on supervisors. Um, one of the reasons um, that therapies often fail is because they don't have a treatment focus, right? This was the second thing that we covered up through. And our treatment focus consists of our case conceptualization. Now our case conceptualization, we begin to formulate it in a tentative way from the very first interaction we have with the client. And then we're constantly reformulating and reworking it as we go on. Um, we're trying to understand, okay, what is the problem? How did it develop? How is this problem continuing to occur in the present here and now situations. And then we talked about these three core conditions. Um, I don't think conditions was, <laughs> was the right word that I wrote down there. Um, three core concepts, I think, was the word that I was looking for. The process dimension, the corrective emotional experience, and client response specificity. Who can tell me what the process dimension is? Yes, how, what is going on in the interaction between the client and the therapist? How does this differ from content? What's the, what's the process versus content distinction? Um, being the main focus is on what's happening in the moment right now, yep. and the initial process from that, rather than exploring further deeper into the issue. Not quite, not quite. Who can tell me the distinction of process versus content? 
Exactly, exactly. So you may have been getting that in different words, but the content is what's being said, right? Somebody may say, I'm having suicidal thoughts. That's the content, right? That's something that freaks new therapists out. It can also freak old therapists out if we don't know how to intentionally respond to it. On one hand, that can be communicating, I'm planning after this session to go kill myself. On the other hand, it could be communicating, I'm so overwhelmed and I'm, I'm feeling so scared and the only way I know how to get the comfort that I want and that I need is to tell you that I'm gonna kill myself. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a threat. We always need to take the, the threat of suicide seriously. But if we are not tuned into the process, we won't know how to interpret what the client is saying and we'll get caught in the content and we will not be moving effectively. And who can tell me what a corrective emotional experience is and why that's important? Yes, but I would say, although it does involve in vivo learning, which you would refer to as an exposure, right? You're kind of talking about, this would be like an exposure technique, the way you're describing, is you're afraid of elevators? Okay, go into an elevator, stay there for an hour, and you'll realize you're still okay, your anxiety will decrease. So we're using that same sense of we are in vivo, in life, activating these fear structures. But the difference is that the corrective emotional experience is something that happens naturally and spontaneously in therapy. So we are not um, manipulating the session in order to um, elicit the anxiety. It's gonna happen naturally. Now there are techniques where you will do that and that can be very, very helpful. But for our purposes in the interpersonal process when we're talking about the corrective emotional experience, what we're referring to is when clients start responding in problematic ways or ha when they start responding with problematic expectations when the therapist acts in a new and helpful way that disconfirms their problematic schemas and expectations and gives them the actual experience of a new relational response for when they're in need. Um, when the client starts doing something and they expect you to do the same song and dance that everybody else did, invalidate or don't care or drift off into thought, when we can respond in a different and helpful way, it is a corrective emotional experience because it's correcting the faulty expectations that the client has for you based on their developmental and relational history. And the in client response specificity. Yeah, Nick. Exactly, exactly. The key word is flexibility. The key thought in um, client response specificity is what relational experience does this person need to change? What relationship experience do I need to provide for this person in order to help them change? That's the key to client response specificity. Some people will need you to be more warm. Some people might actually want you to be a little bit farther off. One of the keys to the kind of interpersonal approach is that it disavows the belief that, well, some clients just work better with some therapists, right? When we are stuck in our own interpersonal patterns, well, then we'll have some clients that were like, oh, I work really well with them. And we'll have some people that's just like, well, I just don't work well with this client. And there are maybe some exceptions. The exceptions would be if somebody 
activates countertransference to a point where it's like, okay, I haven't really been able to work through this yet. I realize I need to. I just realize that this person, you know, for example, if you were um, abused by your father and you were working with an abuser, right, a father who's an abuser, that would be a situation that would probably evoke so much in you that it would eliminate your ability to be objective and effective. Um, but other than the kind of extreme cases, with the interpersonal process, we believe that our, re our responsibility is to be flexible in relationships. And so we need to understand, what does this person need in the experience? How do I give it to them? And we need to be able to deliver. And so then we talk about the historical context, the interpersonal domain. And who can tell me what the interpersonal domain is? You've done well so far, but I'm going to give someone else a shot at this one. Who else can tell me? The interpersonal domain. Yeah. Um, I've heard that how it's like uh, a different relationship system that can bring you to a more discomfort and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, that becomes our self system. So the different interpersonal patterns, the different, inter the different styles of relating. So the interpersonal domain refers to the ways we learn to protect ourselves in relationships. These ways we learn to protect ourselves in relationships become stable enduring dispositions of personality. Um, and then we started with the cognitive domain, object relations, attachment theory, and CBT. And we are going to breeze through this um, relatively qu quickly, okay? Um, Autumn, would you do me a favor and fix that? I'm sorry. It does not want to cooperate today. So here we are on the cognitive domain. Cool. Um, and we have um, object relations theory. Attachment theory. Um, and CBT. Object relations theory proposes that it's very similar to the interpersonal domain. So here we're talking about the historical context. So you guys will find that many of these similars really overlap. Uh, many of these similars really overlap. Many of these um, theories really overlap, and that's because we're talking about kind of how the interpersonal process as we know it right now came to be. And so the object relations domain refers to, or proposes that early relationships develop the way we relate to others in the future. Yes? It is, yes, yes. Although that term was developed by the cognitive therapists. It's, but the, exact it's the exact same thing. Schemas, internal working models, um, relational patterns, these are all words that we'll use interchangeably. And yes, Nick. It proposes that we internalize our early relationships, especially with our child, with with our parents, and those become mental representations, mental tools that we use for all relationships going forward. And so then we have uh, attachment theory, and this takes object relations theory and refines it and takes it one step further. So in attachment theory, attachment theory clarifies the role of early attachment figures, proposing that attachment figures have to provide two things, a secure base, or sorry, a, a secure haven and a safe base. Secure haven and a safe base. A secure haven is an emotional space that a child can bring their, um, their problems to. And a safe base is a secure relationship from which they can explore the world. Now, our attachment is going to develop depending on how well our parents are able to identify, accurately identify our needs and appropriately and attentively respond to them. This builds trust. And the attachment theorists developed three different types of attachment. Avoidant, um, 
ambivalent. And dismissive in childhood. Nope, sorry, that's not true. Avo avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized. And we'll just speak briefly of these today. Like I said, we'll have a whole chapter to go over them later on. Avoidant relationships occur between the parent and the child when the parents deny or invalidate or reject the child. This creates in the child a counter-dependence, right? So the child learns when I go to mom and dad, they don't respond to my needs. And so what the child does is they learn I'm more safe. They, they learn that independence equals safety. But they learn it to such a degree that it becomes kind of the core structure of how they re approach relationships. And when they learn that with mom and dad, later on they apply that same attachment to other people. This becomes dismissive attachment in adulthood, right? So it's the same thing. They just change the, the terms. Why do they do that? To make your tests harder, I guess. I don't know. It always frustrates the hell out of me that they change the terms when you go into adulthood. The second would be ambivalent attachment. And ambivalent attachment occurs when parents are intrusive, inconsistent, and they don't support independence. Essentially, it creates this stance of, I don't really know if you'll be there or not when I need you, right? The child develops a mixed messages of kind of like, come close, come close, come help me, go away, go away, I don't want your help. And this happens because the same, their parents, the same people who at some points provided emotional comfort, at other times were scary, right? So mom and dad at some points was very warm and safe, and at other points very, um, unsafe, very scary. So they get a confusing message of mom isn't really trustworthy. Sometimes she's a safe space. Sometimes she's a dangerous space. And so they internalize that relationship and it becomes a template for the rest of their relationships moving forward of, oh, sometimes my therapist is a safe place. Sometimes my therapist is a really dangerous place. And so they may notice things like changes in your facial tone, changes in your words, Right? I have some glorious eye bags. It's just in my skeletal structure, right? They might say, oh my gosh, are you, you look kind of tired today. Like, are you okay? And what they're doing is they're trying to feel out safe space, unsafe space, right? So you get these back and forth dynamics. Um, did, was there a question there? For ambivalent? Uh, in, yeah, intrusive, inconsistent, they don't support independence, right? So for one thing, maybe a, a, a parent that does everything for their child, right? Ties their child's shoes to a point where they go to school and they don't know how to tie their shoes, right? And then that creates this dependence, but also a shame in that dependence because they don't have a sense of self-efficacy. Um, and so then disorganized, and this ambivalent attachment becomes preoccupied attachment later on in life, right? So this question of, I want them to be there for me, but I don't think they will. Avoidant is, you know, I just don't think they're gonna be there for me, so I'm gonna steer clear. And then disorganized is exactly what it sounds like. It's a disorganized attachment style, and disorganized attachments typically occur in more severe experiences of abuse, neglect, and trauma. Essentially, what disorganized is, is the worst of both worlds for ambivalent and avoidant. They, their lives have been so difficult that they don't actually have a coherent way to attach to people, right? Some people were very good, some people were very dangerous, some people were extremely dangerous to the point of shattering their worlds, that they don't have a stable and enduring working model. And this creates a lot of erratic behavior. So there's, um, typically trauma and abuse, the scary behavior, um, mistrust um, and demanding a lot of times um, because they are hyper vigilant for danger. Um, they are going to be on the edge of their seats and they're gonna, the, the disorganized individual, this is typically what we would look at as borderline personality disorder, kind of hits the disorganized attachment style on the head. Sometimes looking for safety again in a similar way to the ambivalent, right, a little bit unsure, but in this, those patterns of close and far away are highly exacerbated and are very extreme. Um, 
And so this is going to be really key in us knowing, okay, how do I respond to this client in this situation? One of the core aspects of attachment theory would be separation anxiety. And so attachment theory holds that the most threatening thing for a child is separation from the parents. And so they learn these different styles of behavior as attempts to stay close to the parents and stay protected. This is very similar, of course, to what we talked about with Sullivan. And indeed, um, attachment theory was an offshoot. Um, and then finally, we have the cognitive domain. And the cognitive domain explores how do the different ways we think affect our relationships and um, our emotions. Right? So CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, Albert, not Albert Beck. What's Beck's first name? Why can't I think of Beck's first name? Can someone tell me? No. His last name is Beck, I can tell you that much. Um, what he recognized was that people who are depressed consistently have a bias in how they interpret events and situations. They have a schema bias, which is a consistent bias that interprets relationships, situations, events, and results in misconceptions, oh, that is not a big A, misconceptions, distorted attitudes, invalid premises, unrealistic expectations, um, and then more recent theor theorists took this belief, yeah. Misconceptions, so this bias in thinking, a problematic bias, creates misconceptions, distorted attitudes, invalid premises, and unrealistic goals and expectations. A schema, this really talks about, what we're talking about is schemas. A schema is an internal working model, right? Um, a schema is a way of looking at the world, right? So think of a schema as glasses. If you have poor vision, your glasses are going to make things bigger, right? That's kind of like a schema. It's your way of looking at the world. Another word that's used here oftentimes is a heuristic, right? But a schema is a way of interpreting events. In CBT, what CBT believes is that the reason that people become depressed is because they develop schemas that interpret things in a problematic way. It's not flexible. And so the belief in CBT is, okay, change your thoughts, you change your feelings. But we'll take a little bit of a different approach in our work. We're not gonna focus on automatic thoughts. We're not gonna focus on those distortions so much. What we're looking at is understanding that our thoughts are connected our problematic thoughts, beliefs, and assumptions are connected to our problematic relational experiences. So there's a both-way relationship. Prom problematic relationships create problematic beliefs and thoughts. Problematic beliefs and thoughts affect problematic relationships, and the cycle continues. So we'll learn that when somebody's operating in a problematic relational style, they'll also be employing problematic thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, a felt sense of being inferior, like I'm, I'm, I'm just never gonna get, I'm never gonna get what I deserve in life. It would be, be a distorted attitude, right? It's a fixed way of interacting with the world, which isn't accurately f f flexible to de to respond to the demands of life's ambiguities. Mm -hmm. um, one of the keys here in our work is that when we recognize that a problematic schema is activated, we want to talk about it in the moment that it's occurring. 
when somebody is active in this belief that nobody cares about me, that's the moment that you want to intervene. You don't want to talk about it next week. You might if you didn't talk about it that session. But when somebody's saying, nobody cares about me, I'm totally alone. What might be a process comment that you could make there to intervene, right? This problematic schema that nobody cares about me is activated. This problematic mental framework is activated. What would be the process comment? Yes. If your goal was to create empathy, communicate empathy, that would be the perfect intervention. But if your goal is to bring an attention to the problematic schema that's activated, both can be good interventions in the moment. It's not that creating empathy in that moment is wrong. Think about a process comment, Mina. You could, you could, if you think there is something that you said or have done that maybe triggered it. What else, what's the obvious thing? Think about it, someone's sitting there in front of you, you're a therapist, and they say, nobody cares about me. Okay, so that could be a way that you could help somebody. That last question, what do you think is causing that aloneness? That could be a way that you could isolate and help them recognize the, the mindset that they have at that moment, but not quite. We're using the interpersonal process, here and now interventions, to bring to mind how the client's problematic ways of interacting with the world are interacting with the client and the therapist, and how that same problematic pattern is actually stopping them from getting what they want and need from the therapist. Abe. Yeah. yeah. This is, it's the low hanging fruit. But here's the thing. You actually don't want to say it like, okay, I have to convince this person. What, I, what you want to do is you want to explore it. Say, Abe, I hear the loneliness and the isolation that you're feeling right now. You feel totally alone, like nobody cares about you. But I also feel myself thinking, well, I care about you. And I, I feel myself actually caring for you in the here and now. And I'm wondering, what's happening here and now that's getting in the way of the care that I'm feeling towards you and you receiving that care? So what we did there was we highlighted this feeling of nobody cares about me is happening in the here and now between us the key is that we're doing this in a non-defensive way. You do not want to say, what the heck? I care about you, stupid. Wake up. <laughs> That's not what you're saying. You're saying like, hey, you're exploring it. I care about you. But I also hear you saying right now that you feel alone. What's happening in this gap between us? Maybe it's, well, you're just a therapist. You're getting paid. Maybe it's, well, the important people in my life don't care about it. Maybe it's, well, the real relationships don't care. And we want to say, hey, listen, this is a real relationship. Those things are probably defensive. We don't say it that way, but um, that's kind of the, the, long, the long, long work of it. Um, so our key is when, when the defenses are activated, when the problematic relational styles are activated, that is when we want to intervene. Um, so the last, I don't know if that's how you spell familial, <laughs> um, is the familial and cultural domain. Yes, yeah, so we, no, this is outside the cognitive domain. So we are shifting back to those core um, concepts, right, historical concepts. One of the historical concepts was the um, cognitive domain, and now we are moving out of the cognitive domain into the family 
systems domain. And what's key in the family domain is that families operate as systems. That's the key here. And systems develop rules. Families develop rules about how they can communicate, but these rules are, are seldomly spoken. But these rules determine who can speak, to whom, about what, who's able to make a decision in the family, who's not, right? Maybe mom and dad say, hey, we're gonna go out to dinner. And the kids say, I wanna go to Arby's. And the parents say, no, that's a parent decision, right? The parent is crushing dependence there, right? Now, of course, it, one of the keys here is that children and parents are equal in dignity. And that reality ought to be expressed in every interaction between the parent and the child. That the authority is secondarily, right? Of course, parents are responsible to their children, but they are not more than, they're not better than, they're not worth more. And so when that happens, parents grab onto authority, unspoken rules occur, rules like we don't talk about dad's drinking, right? Or we don't talk about dad's OCD, or we don't talk about mom's affair, right? Or we don't talk about my little brother's behavioral problems. Or we don't talk about how grandma died. When these patterns happen over and over again, they become these unspoken rules. And then oftentimes, individuals are scripted into roles. Right? So the family kind of pushes a role. The youngest child is like what? How do youngest children usually act? JP, I know you have a question. We'll come to you afterwards. Do you have a, also an answer? Repeat. Repeat. Um, when you think of a youngest child, what do you think of? Yeah, what's the youngest child role? Yeah. So maybe there's a rule that the youngest child is inferior because age, so they're, they're inferior of attention, right? So they don't deserve attention, right? The oldest child has to be responsible. Um, roles like, you know, Terry is the caregiver of the house even though Terry is the daughter. And so Terry takes care of mom and dad and works out their relationship, right? Probably many of you guys are familiar with what it feels like to be between mom and dad or to f feel what it is like to be the kind of peacemaker in the relationship. You guys did that because you're good at it. You have a knack for it. And you said, hey, that anxiety about you guys splitting up, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm not gonna let that happen. So I'm gonna step here and hold you guys together because I would be lost without both of you, right? Sometimes we do that as individuals quite successfully, sometimes not because it ultimately it's outside of our control but we develop this role, and it's not by our own choice, it just happens to us. And so these unspoken rules govern how we express emotions, such as sadness, irritation, and happiness. Um, and there are very tight expectations for if you're allowed to be separate, if you have to be together, right? We call this individuation. So the role of the family is to create individuals that are differentiated, that are individualized, right? And differentiation occurs when we have a balance between individuality and togetherness. The goal of the family, and this is Bowenian systems theory, is that the family should create individuals who are able to say both at the same time, I'm a member of this family, and I am my own person. Oftentimes, children aren't able to do that because the family doesn't create the environment to learn that. And they have to either pick, I'm a member of a family, and so my life actually becomes ruled by other people's opinions, or 
I'm my own individual, and they become a rebel, and they, they be act in a counter-dependent way, right? Mom says go left, I'm going to go right. I don't even know what's right, but I'm going to go right because I don't like when mom controls me. The goal of the family is to create people who are able to both understand I'm an individual fully, and I'm part of a family fully. That is what happens when we learn to be experiencing our emotions without being overwhelmed with them, by them. To experience care for other people without being completely drawn in. To experience autonomy and individuality without shame. Um, and then the cultural domain. Um, and the key here, this is really an ever-developing sense um, that we have to be mindful of individuals cultures. Family roles differ. Traditions differ. Yes, JP. Can I just ask real quick? Um, when you were talking about like the different groups of parents being with the parents, when you were giving some example of like how they would change that. Well, if you do you remember what I said? I don't remember what I said. Well, you, you were saying how Th is there a specific question in there? In the interactions, they need to act that out. So, when parents treat children as if they are inferior persons. So, like, like when they're with parents, like when they don't talk about the father to the son, how does that work? Pardon? Because it's, well, it doesn't, it's not a direct relationship in that situation. But one of the things you're teaching the child is that you're inferior to other people who have authority over you. You're inferior in dignity and worth to people who have authority over you, which is to say you're not as important as your boss as a person, which is not true. But the second aspect is when you do that, you don't give the person the right to express their experience in what's happening, right? So people say, oh, I can't say that my boss is doing something that's super problematic. And that, cre that inferiority sustains a problematic role in later relationships. Um, so there's the um, familial and cultural domain. In the cultural context, we see that cultures pass down relational traditions for better and for worse, right? So in the United States, our culture is highly individualistic. The benefit of this is that people experience a great deal of autonomy and freedom. But one of the problems with this is that our nation is in a tremendous crisis of isolation, disconnection, and pain. Now in collective cultures, Right? We were talking the other day about how um, issues are expressed in, in your culture. There is a great togetherness, but oftentimes the individual experiences themselves as not being able to act on their own or as being more impacted and controlled by what the family says is okay or not okay. This can vary from who you're going to marry to your prof profession to where you're going to live or where you're not going to live. And so we see that our families pass these different traditions down. Um, Father, you were telling me about how, um, we were talking about how um, marital problems are expressed in uh, Lagos, yeah? So when a, when a wife is upset with the husband, how does she communicate that upsetness? Does she say, what the hell's wrong with you? No. Yeah. <laughs> Too much salt to the food. I'm just dumping salt in the Dump all the salt in the food and walk away. Now, in the United States, if somebody came in and said that to us, we would probably interpret that and say, well, that's passive aggressive behavior. What the wife really needs to do is she needs to stand up for herself and say, hey, 
I need you to change this behavior. And perhaps there's something to learn, right? We, we need to be in a cultural dialogue. But there's something for us to learn, too, that there's ways that we can be attentive to other people to pick up, OK, I'm doing something wrong here, in the unspoken communications. There's, there's cultural connections that we can have that can let us know without saying, hey, something's wrong here. But you know, that's, if somebody comes into my office and um, they're from Lagos and they say, my, my wife has been dumping too much salt in the food, I'm gonna say, what are you coming to me, a therapist for? <laughs> you know, get her, get her, get her some cooking lessons or whatever it is, right? I wouldn't hear the, the cultural importance there. And so what's important is that when we are interacting with individuals from other cultures, we want to be curious. We want to be interested. We want to be receptive to what does this behavior, what does this pattern mean in your culture? Um, and you don't need to be an expert in a culture to create a collaborative relationship with somebody who's from a very different culture than you. What you need to do is say, hey, I want to learn. I'd like to learn how these things are important for you if you'd show me, and I think I can. And that, once the therapist does that over and over and over again, you can achieve a cultural credibility. One of the other aspects that's really interesting to see in the family domain is the way intergenerational things are passed on. So if you do a genogram, right, which is essentially you draw out the different ways of relating, what you'll see is that mom's relationship with dad might not be so different from from grandma's relationship with grandpa, right? You see like, oh my gosh, mom had this relationship with dad. My grandparents, right, dad was an alcoholic. And I see, oh my gosh, my dad's an alcoholic and mom's in this helping role. And oh my gosh, I realize I'm kind of drawn. And you don't think it'll be so obvious, but I guarantee you guys look back, you peel a couple layers from your generations and you will see that there are these patterns of relationship that get passed down and get passed down and get passed down. Oftentimes, these are patterns of great strength and resilience and love. And oftentimes as well, these are patterns that are destructive, hurtful, um, and problematic. Our work with individuals is not to blame, it's not to castigate, it's not to attack. What we are seeking to do is help individuals to have a realistic understanding of what happened in their childhood, how it's affecting them now, and how to change that. So that was a uh, little bit longer than um, maybe I thought, but it's, it's good stuff and it's important. We'll reiterate it all through the chapter. So here we are on chapter two, establishing a working alliance. And the goal for this chapter is that we are exploring how therapists can use empathic understanding to help create a strong working alliance, and then how you can use process comments to restore it when misunderstandings, which are inevitable to occur, will occur and rupture the relationship. Remember, we don't have to be threatened by ruptures. <laughs> ruptures propose an opportunity to create a even more secure relationship, right? You don't feel, having a relationship with someone where you've never experienced a problem might feel like security, but it's not. Because what the hell's gonna happen when you experience a problem, right? You experience security with someone when you have a relationship in which you've experienced problems and you are satisfied with the way you've been able to work through those problems and address them. That's what the type of relationship is that we wanna create with individuals. So the working alliance, um, is trust in the relationship. That's essentially what it is. It's trust, and the key is in the relationship. It's much more helpful to teach people that they can trust the relationship rather they can, than they can trust the person. Because the relationship is something that's dynamic, right? And People are rather fickle. 
and um, unpredictable. But a relationship, if you can trust a relationship, that's something that really endures. The relationship is something that actually endures after death, right? This is what the grief process is. The grief process is helping someone to understand and honor the importance of the relationship and helping them to learn how to maintain ties in the relationship. In grief work, what we're teaching people is the relationship has changed in definite ways, but it's not over. How can we help you to maintain this relationship, but in a different way? a hugely different way, a painfully different way, but the relationship remains. And so what we are teaching people to do is to trust the relationship. So the first stage of our work is um, to build a working alliance. That means that the client is able to trust in the, in the therapist's competence to help the therapist is able, the client is able to trust, I think you can actually have the ability to help me, as well that the therapist actually cares, that their care is authentic. And again, our goal, where do I wanna put this? I'm just gonna put it right in here. Our goal in this work is to help resolve problems in a way, our, our goal is to resolve problems in a way that also boosts self-efficacy. So we're trying to help the client to actually solve the problem that they have, but the process we're employing is that it's actually, we're helping them solve the problem by helping them to learn the problem solving themselves. We are not solving the problem for them because that doesn't actually empower, it just exacerbates shame and a sense of inadequacy. So we're helping resolve the problem in a way that builds self-efficacy and belief in oneself. What was point B? Our goal. That's just the goal, and these two points are underneath that goal. In order, mm, that should have been A. In order to do this, in order to become empowered, clients have to have ownership over the change process. If clients don't have ownership over the change process, there's no space for empowerment. So what we are doing is creating collaboration. This is really one of the most important and challenging aspects of the interpersonal process is we're, because we're used to doctor-patient relationships. We're creating a relationship that says, hey, you and I, we're all on the same team, and we're actually working together. But the type of team and the way that we are working together needs to be different. It needs to be more helpful than your previous experiences. And so in order to build trust with the therapist, um, in order to establish the working alliance, the therapist's hope and role is to establish empathy. It's to communicate empathy. To do this, right, the client has to feel that the therapist grasps their distress, grasps the issue, sufficiently understands what the actual problem is, that the therapist feels with them and is actually emotionally connected to their pain, that the therapist is an ally, that they're actually on their side with the individual's best interest at the therapist's heart, and that the therapist is actually committed, that the therapist actually is committed to helping the individual through this difficulty. What research finds over and over is that the ability to establish the working alliance is the most important predictor of treatment success, period. But this is not an emotional state that you have. 
it's not a warm disposition, although they might, that might help. Communicating empathy. We want to think about that vision of the difference between a warm bath and a cool lake, right? Empathy is something that's actually quite sharp. The reason we think it feels kind of soft and warm is because when we hit the nail on the head of empathy, we feel understood. What feels good is when somebody understands you. That's what creates the warm feeling of safety, right? Somebody creating the warm feeling of safety is not empathy. Empathy is communicating that you understand. And so when we're creating the working alliance, it's a process where we are agreeing on what's wrong, what the problem is, and that we share the same therapeutic goals. We're collaborating and agreeing about how we're going to work together to meet those goals. And we're developing a sense of trust. We're developing a, a, a relationship that's collaborative that's based on trust, that's based on belief that the therapist is going to be there. So when we're looking at um, collaboration, collaboration is an alternative to the directive and the non-directive stances. Collaboration is the alternative to the directive and the non-directive. In the very first session, our goal is to give an experience of this working partnership for the client. This is something that at times we will express by saying, hey, I want to work together with you. And it's actually important to do that. But you know how... Um, Maybe it's St. Francis, maybe it's a misattributed quote, maybe it's something else, I don't know. But there's a quote that's thrown around lots of times, right? Preach the gospel at all times and sometimes use words, or when you have to use words. That's what we're doing in this work together. We are acting out collaboration at all times, and sometimes we're saying that we're doing that. Now, it is more important in the beginning to say, hey, we're going to do collaboration and to express what that is. But from the very beginning, we're trying to give the therapist the experience of somebody wanting to work with them. What they've found in the research is that there's typically, in, in motivational interviewing, which is a really great uh, therapeutic approach, they found that there's kind of typically two different styles that differentiate between effective and ineffective therapists. There's the expert that's focused on persuading the client to change, and when somebody tells you to change, it actually increases resistance. When somebody tells you, you should really do this, without honoring that or why that's happening, it, it actually typically, especially when these are like ingrained things, it increases our attachment to that. And it's actually counterintuitive. On the other side, with a collaborative counselor, what they found is that people became less resistant when the therapist tried to understand the person's motives and then joined them where they're at. And so therapy is not something that we do to clients, but it's a shared interaction that requires participation from both sides. How do we do this? At the beginning, we are asking clients, what do you know about treatment? Were you in treatment before? And we're exploring their expectations of the process that they've been in before. So we are, we are jumping in from the beginning, saying like, hey, let's touch base, it, base here. Um, and we, that's called role induction. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. 
but we have to understand, okay, what is the starting point for this client? What do you know? What do you expect? And so then to discuss the issues with the directive style. This is the way we usually experience things in the helping situation, right? So doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever it is, we show up, we ask them, what do I do? And they tell us what to do. I would probably say that most of the time that doctors tell people to do things, they don't do them, right? And if they did, we would have a high, highly, highly, highly decreased experience of cardiovascular disease in the United States, right? If, if, if it was effective what doctors do, saying, hey, clean up your diet, get a regular sleep routine, go outside, connect with people, it would be great. But it doesn't work, right? The issues with this is, for one thing, um, one of the misconceptions is that the client, this is part of the issue, is that because of this, the client's gonna come to therapy, most of them, and they're gonna expect the therapist to just give them, like, here's your prescription. Here's how to get healthy. And so the client kind of comes with that baggage. And they're also, when this happens, it increases shame. Because nobody, we talked about unrealistic expectations. Nobody likes not knowing what to do or how to act. It's not pleasant, it's not enjoyable, right? It's scary. Usually these are the times that we've been hurt. And so when people don't know what to do and they just do whatever the therapist tells them, they're actually gonna feel controlled. And when individuals feel controlled, that's gonna exacerbate shame, and oftentimes that's the very interpersonal process that's brought people to treatment in the first place. So we will pick up um, with issues re relating to the non-directive style on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>